Greetings, Zero Books viewers and listeners. This is Daniel Tut, and I'm the host of the Jouissance Vampires podcast, which looks at the intersection of psychoanalysis, Marxism, and radical philosophy. Today we sit down with Doug Green, Zero Books author of A Failure of Vision, Michael Harrington and the Limits of Democratic Socialism. Harrington's ideas still permeate the left and still influence the organization that he founded, the Democratic Socialists of America, or the DSA, which is today the largest socialist organization in America. I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right. Welcome and good evening, friends and comrades. I'm Daniel Tut here with Jouissance Vampires podcast and joined today tonight by Doug Green, a Marxist historian coming at us from Boston. Uh, Doug is someone who is a researcher. His first book is on Blanqui, um, and he is a just a very, very serious Marxist uh, theoretician and historian. So um, tonight, we've invited Doug to join us to talk about his forthcoming book, A Failure of Vision, on Michael Harrington. Um, Harrington is, well, Harrington used to be a household name in America. Um, Harrington was the face of what Americans, uh, thought of when they thought of socialism, they tended to think of Michael Harrington. Um, therefore it's quite important, especially for the new generation that have mobilized to the DSA, the organization that Michael Harrington founded. Uh, it's just slightly important that people understand what this person thought, where he came from, what his influences were, um, and how his thought still lives with us today and how it still very much shapes the DSA, shapes uh, the DSA's reliance, what I would call a kind of paternalistic reliance on the Democratic Party. And I want to begin with a clip of Harrington himself a couple years before he died, uh, where he makes the defense, makes the argument for working with the Democrats. Check out this clip. But why then uh, do I still, as I do, work within the Democratic Party? Why did I go to Atlanta? Why do I think that this party uh, is the way to go? Why don't I support the notion of a third party that would really say what it meant, come up with a program for the economic and social crisis of our time, uh, and deal with the issues. And the reason is simply this, that in the crazy politics of the United States, you have a Democratic Party which contains some of the worst people in the country, some of the outstanding racists, sexists, union busters, cold warriors, and God knows what else are in the Democratic Party. At the same time, that same party contains most of the best people. And if you say, this is a contradiction, this is an impossibility, this is something that shouldn't happen, I couldn't agree more. The problem is, this is America. This is what we get out of our structures, out of our party system. I believe that we have to change the party system. I believe that the kind of issues that are going to be on the agenda in the future are such that we're going to have to really face up to issues. But how do you change it? And I think the way you get a new party in the United States, ironically, is not through starting one. The last time that was done, more or less, was the Republican Party in the 1850s. The way you get a new party in the United States is by transforming an old party. So, Doug, what do you what do you make of this? Can you kind of give us a context of this clip? And then and then I want to go back to to Harrington um, and talk about his biography a little bit before we talk about his ideas. But let's start with where we're at. At the end of his life, he insists on this line of working with the Democratic Party. And wh 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 why was he so insistent upon this? Help, help us out here. Sure. So he gave that, that clip towards about a year year before he died. So this is 1988. It's after the Democratic Convention that was held in Atlanta that year. And he's very sick at that point. He's about 60-ish years old. And Michael Harrington, that's 
that's actually a good summation of basically what he focused on through most of his political life. And if you were to give a name to Michael Harrington's political vision, it's something called realignment. Now, he considers himself a socialist and a Marxist, albeit a democratic Marxist. And his idea is that where the United States, to get a labor or socialist party, they need to, socialists and leftists need to go into the Democratic Party to realign it. That means to get all like the racists and capitalists to go to the Republican Party and make the Democrats effectively into a party like the German social democracy, the Swedish social democracy, which will then pass a bunch of reforms and give us a, a welfare state like in Sweden or somewhere in Europe and then eventually Europe. So basically he said at one point in one of his articles, like realignment is the only place that political beginning can happen. So that's why it's so important. And that's essentially what he does from roughly 1960 onward. Now he does not originate the idea of realignment or leftists going into the Democratic Party. He takes some existing ideas, including people he worked with, and he really refined them, developed them, and made them into a strategy. And it guided all, almost all the organizations he was a part of, the Socialist Party, um, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, and lastly, the Democratic Socialists of America, all of which he was either a leader of or a very influential member of. So Harrington becomes famous for writing this book called The Other America, which is a expose of poverty. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is quoted as saying that Michael Harrington is the man who uh, taught Americans that some of us are poor. So Harrington began as a kind of um, bohemian. Uh, he went to Yale. Um, he sort of was in, a, a, I would say, a very elitist uh, cultural milieu as a youth. Um, he, so that I want to, I want to invite you to talk about his youth, talk about his upbringing, talk about kind of the man himself. Um, but, um, but so, so people understand, um, it was almost, uh, unexpected that Harrington became, um, that he rose to fame off of this book, which was actually, as you mentioned, um, in your, in your book, his book was only, made so widely read because it was reviewed in the New Yorker, um, which is interesting. But tell us just briefly, okay, so what's what's the most like essential biographical things about Harrington that we need to know? Like, yeah. Well, um, the fact is uh, he's he was born to a very middle class, upper middle class, if you want, Irish Catholic family out in Missouri, uh, New, uh, St. Louis, I believe. And his family, again, very Catholic, very much in the Democratic Party. And he's, he's born in roughly 1928. So he doesn't really experience the Depression. I mean, he kind of sees it, but it doesn't really affect him. And he's uh, he goes to Catholic school through most of his life, because since his parents are incredibly devout, and so is he. Um, he when after he graduates high school in 1944, he just misses the cutoff to join the Army in World War II. He ends up going to Holy Cross near where I live, actually, here in Massachusetts, and then later to Yale and the University of Chicago. And during that whole time, his parents want him to go into law. He kind of does not want a, a career as a lawyer. He's interested in literature and poetry. He reads like a lot of existentialists, Kierkegaard, Camus, people like that. And you're right, he moves in these very bohemian circles. He really, he when he's in Yale, he likes to travel down to New York and experience bohemia when he's in chicago he does the same thing so he encounters a lot of leftist ideas and at one point he's kind of questions his faith he drops out of his faith and when he's visiting his parents at one point he experiences poverty and he's so um heartbroken by it and so it just shocks him he wants to do something about it so around 1950 he he ends up, he's back in New York, he's working odd jobs, but he ends up joining um, the Catholic Worker, which is uh, founded by Dorothea Day. It's this very kind of left-wing Catholic organization um, that really, these members take a vow of poverty. They work, you know, the soup kitchens and whatnot. 
and they're pacifists. And and this actually puts him in an awkward position because um, this is around when the Korean War starts and he refuses to serve as a conscientious objector. And I think through more luck than anything, he doesn't end up going to jail and he's actually honorably discharged from the army. He doesn't actually have to go to Korea. And about eventually though, he kind of um, sees the limits of the Catholic worker and he eventually starts reading Marx and other Marxists. And he's like, he essentially becomes a full blown atheist for good. And he joins the socialist party very briefly but they actually are supporting the Korean War. And he ends up joining something called the Independent Socialist League, which is founded by Mac Shackman. I know we'll talk about that later, but right. they are formally opposed to the, the Korean War and he ends up joining them. Mm -hmm. And just to speed things up a bit, eventually the this is in the 50s, so it's McCarthy and pretty much all leftist ideas are stigmatized to a very large degree. And the ISL is very tiny. But after 1956, there's kind of this possibility for a reopening of the left when the Communist Party essentially collapses under Khrushchev in Hungary. And the Socialist Party is almost dead. It's got very few members. Most of its members are very old. And they kind of look to the uh, Harrington's group and they essentially see, you know, we kind of, uh, we can form this new group that's to the, to take up the energy from the communists. So, Harrington and, and the ISL end up joining the Socialist Party, which because it is so, again, it's so much an empty shell, they end up taking it over. And it's kind of during this period, um, this is the late 50s, so like 90s. And they had very few members. I mean, what Yeah, it's very few members. It's like, I think it's in the low hundreds. I, I right. know I cite the figure. I don't remember it offhand. But it's also very sad because just a generation or two before it was the lodestar of American, the American left. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's somewhat interesting because in a way it's low membership, but many of those individuals and militants had kind of serious political careers when, right. I mean, when yeah. things got much more intense. Um, and, and of course, um, people like Shackman um, develop ideas which are pretty, pretty rad, pretty radical, pretty radical in a reactionary way, like very... Um, uh, stark, it's just shocking almost, especially by the time we get to Vietnam. <laughs> but right. talk talk about the American Trotskyist context in which um, Harrington is swimming. What, what are those um, experiences like? I know it's a very heterodox form of Trotskyism. Um, you had the dispute between Shackman and James P. Cannon. Um, and I think obviously Harrington is drawn to Shackman, you say that Mac Shackman, it's very interesting, Doug, because a lot of this is driven by charisma. They say, you said, and I think in, in an interesting way that Shackman more so than Cannon um, had a certain or oratory uh, capacity and that that's how his ideas kind of had a certain strength or force within the movement. So could you say a little bit more about that, about Shackman in that context? Sure. So, just so people don't uh, who don't know, Max Shackman, he's probably Harrington's most important political mentor, and he's one of the founders of the American Communist Party. And later, when uh, the Trotsky is split, he's one of the founders of American Trotskyism, along with James P. Cannon. And Shackman, probably more than Cannon, is a very noted orator. Um, he really has a following among younger Trotskyists, and he's actually very highly valued by Trotsky himself. He actually, I believe, he presides over the founding of the Fourth International in 1938. Now, um, in 1939-40, um, after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, there's a major split in American Trotskyism that involves Cannon on one side, who says the Soviet Union, you know, it's a degenerated worker state, you know, it's uh, it's got the bureaucracy and Stalin, but it still is something we need to defend against imperialism. And can it, I'm, I'm sorry, Shackman is saying, no, this is a new form of bureaucratic collectivism. It's an evil empire. It's imperialist. We have no business defending it. And Trotsky takes the side of canon. There's a big split around 1940. And Shackman and his crew form something called the, Ameri uh, the American Workers Party or the Workers Party which uh, upholds what uh, 
they basically say neither Washington nor Moscow. We believe in a third camp and they want nothing to do with the Soviet Union critically or otherwise. And they're very, they do some labor organizing during the war, but during the war, they kind of very quickly drop the whole allegiance to the third camp. They see the Soviet Union as the greatest evil in the world. And in a certain, and they're also butting heads with communists within the labor movement, the official American Communist Party, which is supporting the No Strike Pledge during the war. And the Shackmanites are, they're fighting the No Strike Pledge, you know, they're, but they're also event, at first basically on their own, but eventually they ally with liberal elements of the labor bureaucracy, people like Walter Ruther. So by the time the Cold War is happening, they are, or they've kind, they're moving away from any sort of identification with Trotskyism, heterodox or otherwise. There is at some points like critical support for anti-colonial movements in the Third World, like Harrington recalls, like you know he followed very closely, like the fighting in Indochina in the fifties with the with France. But Shackman himself is moving very much away from that. He's offering backhanded support to the Korean War. Now, I want to make this clear that the ISL as a whole is opposed to the Korean War, but Shackman himself is pretty much looking for ways to support it. And you can kind of, if you read my book, it gets kind of convoluted, but that that's how he's justifying it, basically. Like, yeah. we want to have the, you know, support, uh, fight Stalinist imperialism and all of this. Yeah, so 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 Shackman's notion of bureaucratic collectivism would be deeply influential to Harrington. Yes. Because one of the things that Harrington insists upon, and that I think, Doug, we still live with today, is a certain theory of understanding Stalin and understanding the USSR as a totalitarian phenomenon, and therefore imposing third campism uh, domestically in ways that consistently, consistently prevent the emergence of the independent organization of the working class. And um, can you can you talk a little bit about some of the kind of key things that Harrington um, gets from Shackman? Because he's not, again, like you said, Shackman's a mentor. He's not really a Shackmanite per se. Um, so So let's make a kind of pivot to sort of the, you know, how Harrington's thought forms off of this. I mean, they see eye to eye largely into the 60s, and we'll get to that, but the idea of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, China, etc., as bureaucratic collectivism, as these new like class societies. It's basically totalitarianism dressed up in leftist guise. And that is his basic view. It's anti-communism. He accepts that. Something else he takes from Shackman is a reliance on the progressive or liberal wing of the labor bureaucracy. So this is people like Walter Ruther. And I want to emphasize that it, that's something Shackman himself will change on that. But Harrington looks very much to like liberal and progressive elements of the labor bureaucracy in the AFL and the AFL-CIO. The other thing he takes from Shackman, and he's actually the one who developed it much more than, than Shackman, is realignment. Shackman and the ISL were looking for ways to kind of like transform the Democrats, and they had started that in like the late 40s, early 50s. And they kind of develop it more as time goes on. But they kind of are just like pioneers in that, whereas Harrington is really the one who develops the whole realignment to into a full group own strategy. And I'm trying to think if there's anything. There is, um, between them, you know, there is agreement on, like, moving into the Socialist Party, on trying to influence, like, the student movements, but they kind of split over Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I would actually yeah. argue uh, Shackmanism splits into, like, three camps. Hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. I mean, let's pause on the question that Harrington is always concerned, Harrington, um, which is that, and, you know, this is what people were, were obsessed with after the Second World War was the development of a new kind of um, bureaucratic professional class. And th these are technocrats, these are um, scientists, these are professors, 
what today, you know, what Barbara and Ehrenreich and now the left, unfortunately, is obsessed over the professional managerial class. Well, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, Michael Harrington had the notion that it's actually necessary to to ally for working class ends to ally the working class with to link them with the this new professional class. And he never really abandoned that uh, theory, even after it didn't uh, bore any fruit time and again. Right. That right. seems so. And obviously you have someone like James Burnham who writes um, on the power of this new uh, bureaucratic class and how to weaponize it for um, basically, you know, quasi fascistic ends. Right. And here's Harrington basically saying that, look, these are the best allies that we have available to, to the working class. Um, so he has a kind of affinity, um, a kind of romantic affinity uh, to the working class. He's not really of the working class. Um, so he can still kind of come across as a Marxist. So to say, say a little bit more about his insistence on the work working with this new class. Yeah, the new class, you're right, it's something that you can find in Burnham, you can actually find it in Austrian Marxism, and even Karl Kotsky to a certain extent. And, I mean, I think some of this is, like, not really, it's it's almost based on straw men in, like, some of the reasoning for it. But it's basically, like, there's not just two classes in, in society, the workers and the bourgeoisie, there's also, you know, especially after, you know, the third this new class of like these technocrats, bureaucrats, scientists, etc. And he says, you know, we can't go back, you know, to a time without this. This is just a permanent development. And he says there, the, the new class, there are two possibilities. In Eastern Europe, the new class essentially is totalitarian. They are the managers of this new, of the Soviet Union, of Poland, etc., and he says that's a possibility in the West as well, but he doesn't believe it's a foregone conclusion. So he thinks that, you know, especially with the expansion of education after World War II in the United States, that this new class, there might be progressive elements in it. You know, people in the students who are protesting against, you know, segregation, Jim Crow, um, you know, all like, you know, poverty, et cetera. And they might be open to a more, left liberal social democratic worldview that that can be allied with and that's something he it's his idea to form this new majority with them this new like the progressive elements of the new class and the labor movement and essentially to realign the democratic party because he also thinks the new class is going to find political expression along with the labor movement inside the democratic party so he wants to meet them there and win them over to his side and realign the Democrats. So where does realignment first make its appearance as a concept that he puts forward? Um, it starts making its appearance in the later 50s, particularly after JFK is elected. Now he's starting to do early work in the Democratic Party in New York with the like the village independent Democrats, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And by like 1962, 63, he's really pushing this, you know, because he didn't support JFK in 1960, but he was big on LBJ in 1964. Mm -hmm. And he basically, you know, the Socialist Party, you know, because he's essentially writing the program for it, is they want to have this idea that we're going to have this inside outside strategy. We're going to try and pressure the Democrats from without, but inside we're going to work with progressives, liberals, trade unionists, you know, these good bureaucrats, these, yeah. these, and get, you know, put, change the party program, get them more open to um, left liberal ideas. Like he actually thinks like the first step is going to be like a renewed liberalism. Which mm -hmm. so he's very excited about things like um, LBJ's like um, War on Poverty and the Great Society, which are started actually some of the ideas are started under JFK. So he thinks like this is where we got to focus, and eventually 
you know, it will transform the Democrats. So it's right. really in the early part of the 60s. And in fact, it's very, in, if you read the Poor Huron statement, you can find realignment thinking throughout right. it. Right, right, right. Because people need to understand also that Michael Harrington was pretty significantly involved with the civil rights movement, especially the Martin Luther King Jr. side of it. Mm -hmm. um, early on, I was surprised to learn that you wrote that he actually was a stand-in representative for Martin Luther King at certain conferences. Yep. Um, you know, and, and again, taking a step back to what I, I mentioned earlier, the publication of The Other America put him on the lecture circuit, and he was um, effectively within intellectual circles like a household name um, after the publication of that book. And he was then invited um, to be an advisor for uh, for which administrations? For for multiple um, every administration, all the way up to every Democratic administration, all the way up to Carter, right? Uh, so, to to just backtrack a bit, so he had known uh, MLK like in the late fifties, early sixties. You're right; he had um, you know spoken like they. I believe they might have met in like the Democratic convention of 1960. And Harrington himself and, you know, the Shackmanites, they were involved in the civil rights movement. They were red baiters. They wanted to keep out any communist infiltrators. But he did march at events. He was involved in the watch on, March on Washington. And, you know, he was friends with Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Har Harrington himself, he would have been approached, and when it came to the, like, poverty, he'd been approached in, like, the late 50s, early 60s to write on that. And he wrote The Other America, and he didn't think it would be successful. And it was actually a review by Dwight McDonald, who's one of the New York intellectuals. Um, Trotsky had things to say about McDonald and stupidity, which are kind of funny, that um, every, every comment has the right to be stupid, but uh, Comrade McDonald uh, abuses the privilege. So I'm um, sorry, I just had to use that line. But anyhow, um, the McDonald review is what got Harrington's book, The Other America, which I want to just say the book itself is is worth reading. It's not a Marxist or socialist text at all. You have to understand that. It's a very good piece of uh, moralistic liberal reportage, but it's, you know, it's very visceral and he, you know, you can read it in an afternoon. Talks about poverty in all aspects of America and he's essentially calling for a renewed New Deal. And that review of his book caught the attention of JFK but it caught the attention of JFK right before he was killed. Mm. Mm. So after he was killed, LBJ is doing the Great Society and he brings Harrington in to help, you know, with some ideas on the program. Harrington is really at the White House for just like a few weeks and that's actually the closest he comes to any form of like really political influence in the halls of power. And that's like 1963, 64. But Harrington himself, he thinks actually the Great Society is too moderate. It doesn't mm. go far enough. Mm -hmm. That's not to say he doesn't support it. He just, th he, but he's re he just wishes it had gone further. Wanted to see like a third New Deal or, or second New Deal or whatever it is. And, but on he defends the Great Society on the whole. He just, uh, it's not up to his standards, which is more like what they have in Western Europe in terms of yeah. the state. So in a way, because he's exposed to the halls of power, um, he concocts a vision that the most noble thing to do is to temper one's revolutionary um, aspirations for the liberation of the working class and the proletariat and to um, that that would be the, the best path to take, right? To kind of continue to painfully forge this alliance with the new with the new class and with um the democratic party obviously even right. though he has a lot of reluctance to do do so at times he still very much commits himself to it and by the time that you know the 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 student revolts really start to take off in a few years after uh, this time of 64 you know um he's respected by that by the new left but he's also um um, having to tow lines, which make him appear kind of like a dinosaur. Um, but, but I want you, Doug, to talk a little bit about the left wing of, of realism, right? This kind of mantra that Harrington put forward, because I feel that uh, it's an idea that transcends him, and it has become an idea on the left, the liberal and the socialist left, 
that sort of is a reflection maybe even of our own pragmatism uh, or, or excessive pragmatism, right? Um, can you talk a little bit more about the left wing of realism and this undergirding Harrington notion? Where does it come from and how do you understand the kind of um, the logic of it? So in terms of the left wing of realism, you're right. It does transcend him. In fact, I would call it the common sense of the American left, both, you know, pretty much from his time until now. And well, let's go back just a moment. So you have in the U.S. there is no um, like in Western Europe nothing like in like some kind of socialist or labor party, and there's always this temptation for leftists to get involved in the two party system, mostly with the Democrats, at least you know after the late 19th century, and the socialists and communist parties, especially the latter eventually just oriented towards the Democratic Party because they saw like it has this so this progressive constituency like uh, workers, um, black people, women's movements, etc, who are like this kind of base of the Democratic Party and they want to kind of work within that. And the problem is when you, um, this is something I don't think Harrington under ever understood is yeah the Democrats have that you know they do have that they have this facade of being a, a party of the people. You know, they're not just, uh, but they are ultimately serving the liberal wing of the capitalist class. And in order to work within the Democrats, and Harrington, you know, confronts this on many levels, is you have to, to work within them, you have to play by those rules. You can't be talking about revolution. You can't be talking about building socialism. You have to be an anti-communist, especially in the 1950s and 60s. And you can't be encouraging militancy and mass movements. You have to be a fireman for people who hate fires. And Harrington is willing to play by those rules. Shackman is willing to play by those rules. And this common sense, it eventually ends up meaning that realignment is actually a dead letter completely because it just ends up being there is no like 33rd dimensional game of chess going on it really just ends up vote for the democrats every four, four two and four years you know eventually we'll create space and we'll do things but it's just this endless hamster cycle and it's it's a way to take the militancy out of mass movements to take the socialism out of socialism and to just be cheerleaders for um a certain wing of capital yeah and it's yeah. not just harrington who does it the cp does it and so many other organizations have done it and they may do it under different guys harrington actually like really develops the whole rationale for it and a lot of mm -hmm. people who may even detest harrington on many levels are repeating that logic yeah yeah i want to draw attention to another aspect of the logic which is that um harrington believed that by opposing um, radicalism and opposing Marxist conceptions that class actually, um, that there is a ruling class. Because one of the consequences of this is a, a very strange notion to a true Marxist, which is Harrington doesn't really believe that there is a ruling class. Mm -hmm. he, he sort of, but Doug, that's interesting because I think a lot of Marxists today kind of believe something similar to what Harrington believes, right? This goes back to the what transcends. Like this is why we're having this conversation because Harrington's ideas are a kind of part of the ecosystem of the kind of maybe we could say spontaneous ideology on the left today. And that's why your book is so important. But what you say on uh, page 48 is that he believed by opposing radicalism, um, by opposing both the radicalism of the new left, but also opposing communists, um, that this is what helped him abandon his romantic illusion and with making real contact with workers, right? Um, and that in so doing, that's the way to remain most true to socialism, right? So mm -hmm. a kind of liberal reformism uh, with, with a kind of highly uh, 
tempered down set of demands um, is the best way to remain true to socialism. Um, why is that wrong? Why, why is that um, like this sounds so maddening and I had the idea and I know you've written a book on Blanqui of, of the eternal return <laughs> um, because it doesn't it, it hasn't just been since Bernie that we've had to do this thing with the Democrats right 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 um, so can you can you just take a step back and say sort of like um, should this be should this be called Marxism can this be called Marxism in your opinion in my and opinion the, no it's not okay. He calls okay. himself a Marxist. I actually don't consider him, so, him a Marxist, but um, I look at it this way. Um, if you're trying to win someone to socialism, you, you actually have to talk about socialism, socialist ideas, what we mean by economics, politics, philosophy, all that kind of stuff. You have to talk about it. Now, if you, and it's one thing to meet people where they're at. I'm not saying we have to quote Hegel all the time. I love quoting Hegel, but it may not be the first thing you want to do with somebody. Um, you know, you kind of need, that's why we have dialectical materialism. So you don't have to read Hegel all the time. You know? <laughs> that's, that's Harris, that's Harrison Fluss. I'm stealing that from him. But anyhow, um, my, but the thing is, if you suddenly water all that down, you're like, you know, let's, let's take all that out. That's scary. Then you're not winning people to socialism. You're winning mm. people to something else. Right. Your different idea. It's one thing to meet people where they're at, but you don't want to put yourself politically where people are at, especially if it's not at a socialist place. Right. And that's the thing. He's always willing to dial back his his uh, ideas. Like if you, There's not too many talks of Harrington online, but there are a few. And if you watch him, you like at Democratic conventions like that clip, you know, that clip is a little more explicit, but others he just talks like a liberal. Mm -hmm. There's really no socialism there. There's nothing about, you know, fundamentally transforming society, the working class ruling. What what would you say yeah. about the possibility that one way or one logic to read Harrington is a kind of I don't know. He's he's not a boomer. He's older than boomers, right? Um but 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 he does or maybe he is a boomer. Um but he does uh, emerge at a time in American capitalism of what people call a golden age, you know, the welfare state had a certain, you know, Fordist stability, et cetera. And therefore, I was reading a review that was positive because I wanted to read a positive review of Harrington on Jacobin. And it was by a comrade of his, um, you know, that worked uh, at the early days of formation of DSA and before that. And she was saying, well, the struggle that Michael had was revolving around the fact that not only the Cold War piece, but that workers in America generally had it much better than they do now. And that if Harrington were alive in the post 2008 context, he'd be more radical. Um, I want to see what you think about that. Um, I mean, well, he, you're right. He was came of age politically in the fifties, you know, so it's, it's not the best time to be any kind of a leftist, but he was alive in the sixties when there was a lot of opening for radicalism, a lot, a lot even more than now. You know, we're talking black power, we're talking, you know, feminism, the anti-war movement. And he wasn't very radical then. In fact, he was on the far right of those movements. So I, I just don't find that tenable. And the fact is his whole, at the foundation of his worldview is anti-communism. He may call it something else. He may use Marxist verbiage to dress it up, but it's anti-communism. Can you can you talk briefly about his trip um, to a communist youth uh, event when he was younger and the involvement of the CIA in, in possibly that, funding that? I, I get, yeah, this is a, an interesting story. And this part of this is to his credit, and it's one of the few times I'll give him credit, is he wanted to go to, um, I believe it was in East Germany, there was like a you know, one of those communist youth, they bring people from around the world. And he just kind of wanted to go because uh, before then, as a member of the ISL, he was barred from getting a passport and traveling. So now he could. And the CIA obviously wants to have agents and people there to look for, you know, to report back to them. And they wanted to fund him. And, you know, apparently they approached him and he said no. Mm, good. 
Yeah, that now, is good. He ended up going, um, and he actually ended up. Uh, it was it's an interesting story. He actually he was uh, I believe in West Berlin at one point uh, when Willy Brandt, who was eventually a chancellor of West Germany, uh, was was mayor. And he was at the youth festival, and he describes it, I think, in a very, it's kind of a gross way. It's like basically like a Nuremberg rally, which I find kind of vile to say. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, so he, it's still like his, his whole experience is basically viewed like through the lens of anti-communism. But right. yeah, he doesn't accept, you know, CIA funding, which a lot of people around him are involved in like all kinds of CIA funding, Norman Thomas, a lot of the New York intellectuals. But as far as I know, Harrington himself was not. Mm -hmm. He just associated with people who were. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so I do wanna, um, so in Doug's book, it's a wonderful intellectual biography that both examines Harrington's life, but also his ideas. But then um, you end the book uh, with a conversation around this transcendent dimension of Harrington. How does Harrington live on? And I want to talk about that later. But you also talk about Harrington's own theoretical work. He published, I think, 17 books in his life, um, not just the other America, right? Mm -hmm. And he was somewhat prolific. He died of cancer too young in his sick, or like early 60s, right? Um, mm -hmm. In 1989. And... Um, yeah, I mean, we can kind of go back because we, we need to talk about Vietnam and we need to talk about um, the new left. But can we can you say a couple things right now about kind of going back to Harrington's understanding of Marxism and his concept, which I don't know if he invented it, but he has a concept of spiritual materialism. Um, and it's something that he um, uh, could could you help us just elaborate a bit about Harrington the theorist um let's yeah please so review yeah so and this is actually something Harrington himself actually kind of notes if you ever read him extensively he's just like I'm always known for writing out the other America but I wrote all kinds of other books and truthfully the other America is his best I, I most of the others but he writes on everything from culture he writes two books on socialism. He has a book called The Twilight of Capitalism. He has a book on the Third World, all kinds of books on American politics. He's got an interesting book um, called Politics at God's Funeral, which is kind of like what happens after religion is no longer the dominant force in, in Western life. And he's got other books on poverty. And he's actually got, I think, in a bit narcissistic way, two autobiographies, which whatever. But... Um, so spiritual materialism is he rejects um, dialectical materialism. He doesn't like Hegel. He doesn't like Engels that much, you know, for because he thinks dialectical materialism and the whole idea of a, a, a comprehensive Welschenstein is like the gateway to totalitarianism. So he's kind of in he kind of draws a bit on Eric Fromm and he has this idea called spiritual materialism. I think it's kind of a mishmash because he says, first of all, it's more like to quote Pirates of Caribbean, they're not rules. They're more like guidelines. Um, it really, he actually says like, you know, you can't actually understand the world with this. It's not scientific, but it's, it gets away from the sword, you know, scare quotes here, sword and crass materialism of, of, of vulgar Marxism, which is just Marxism, but whatever. And um, that's kind of his idea. And it's just this mishmash because it's like it's not coherent and it's um, it's reviving this old theory of factors. So one day culture is, uh, you know, determining things. Then it's the economy. Then it's politics. It really can't explain things. And he admits that, you know, quite freely. Um, but this is something else I do want to say about Harrington as a Marxist theorist or self-described Marxist theorist is he's incredibly well read. Like if you just go through the bibliographies of his books, he's read Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, Gramsci, some of these people before they were translated into English. Like he translated um, what is Orthodox Marxism by Lukash in 1957. Yeah. 
and if you actually check the MIT Press edition of History and Class Consciousness, he's acknowledged as one of the translators. Yeah. So, so let's let's pause on Lukacs for a moment, Doug, because you know Lukacs opens up what I would call Pandora's box um, in yeah. his um, emphasis that Marxism is kind of reducible to the category of method, and you know there's a lot of truth in that, but there's also a lot of danger that Lukacs couldn't see emerge from. Yeah putting that wager down on paper. Um, I, I literally I literally don't think that Lukács was uh, anticipating how that notion, that idea uh, would be taken up by people and lead to all kinds of crazy revisionism like we have here. Um, how, do, how do you read Lukács into Harrington's own really weird and eclectic Marxism? Yeah, so about that, so that's what you're talking about is uh, in the opening of what is orthodox Marxism, Harrington says, or I'm sorry, Lukács says, you know, we can say if Marxism is, all the premises are wrong, but still call ourselves orthodox Marxism, paraphrasing, so long as we just use the method. I when, I think when he does that, it's more like a rhetorical device when he does it. I don't think he's not, you know, I don't think Lukács actually believes Marx's arguments are wrong. I just think he's making that a rhetorical device when he uses it. But you're right, it does open up a certain Pandora's box. So Harrington just kind of takes that's like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, we can just say the, the theory is one thing and the practice is another. And he uses that to kind of justify his own opportunism because he, he develops this rather sophisticated, albeit eclectic idea of spiritual materialism, but it really has nothing to do with anything he does politically. In fact, he says, you know, Marxist methodology can be completely divorced from practice. And it is certainly in his case, not that he's actually upholding like any form of orthodox Marxism in his practice. So he's not trying to explain the divorce that between, you know, the, between his theory and practice. He's just trying to rationalize it. And that's what he uses Lukács for. Again, I think that's a, a misreading of Lukács' life and work. And I do again. I think that's like a rhetorical device on Lukash's part. But there is your like there is kind of a Pandora's box there, which yeah, Harrington certainly wanted to open. So he really also Harrington also really uh, thinks that the notion of dictatorship of the proletariat is something that Marx kind of said as an aside, but abandoned it, and that it is um, always associated with a kind of um, everything that's wrong about the USSR and a kind of terror, a, te a reign of terror. And like, so, um, and it's true. I mean, the, the concept itself has an element of revolutionary violence. That's a part of it, but Harrington is, um, has such a strong allergy to any possible, uh, conception of class struggle, um, that would actually be one that is centered on the contestation of actual power st uh, uh, stakes that he creates a Marxism completely devoid of any commitment to now that, the, I mean, he's not the only one that's done that, mm -hmm. right? obviously. Um, so I guess my, my question to you is you, can you say a little bit more about um, understanding not only um, Harrington here, but also like, yeah, like what is, what is the kind of wider social Democrat or social democracy position here? Um, and, and sort of how, how does he kind of justify um, that position? And then, and then I actually want to talk to you about like what the idea is in Marxism proper. But let's start with Harrington first. So in terms of the dictatorship of the proletariat, he, well, for Marx, he thinks Marx had this youthful revolutionary phase, you know, the communist manifesto. It's calling for a proletarian revolution, violence and et cetera. But he thinks basically after that, Marx kind of abandoned that and became an advocate for, you know, just a parliamentary road to so electoral road to socialism. And he thinks, you know, the Paris Commune was just this kind of aberration and everything. But he pretty much just reads out of Marxism any form of, or Marx himself actually, any form of the violent struggle to power. He may think that comes from Engels at times, but he just kind of makes Marx into basically this mild-mannered social democratic reformer. You know, if uh, 
you know, it's just kind of fascinating. And he, again, he's not the only one who does that. Um, Bernstein does that in German social democracy with his original revisionism. He's like, you know, that it does the same type of argument. Yeah, this this Blancism in, in early Marx, but we want the later Marx that's very democratic. Um, but I actually think he's actually coming more out of the school of, uh, he may not, I don't think he even acknowledges it, but someone like Kotsky during World War One and the Russian Revolution, where the whole argument against the Bolshe Bolshevism and communism is like, it's just not democratic. That, you know, we don't want a dictatorship. We don't want terror. We want democracy. And you people are just like these newborn Jacobin, you know, terrorists. And, you know, considering his anti-communism, he certainly, there's certainly an element of that in him. And the thing is with social democracy, you know, that's like the clear split that happens. Obviously there's 1914, but they, at that point, they're very clear. They don't want um, Western social democracy. They don't want a dictatorship of the proletariat, whether it looks like the Soviet Union or not, whether it looks like China or not. They just want to have at best maybe some reforms in, in a bourgeois democracy and it should be noted in terms of social democracy especially after world war ii is the nato states were often led by social democratic parties who were part of nato instituting purges waging colonial wars at times some of them may be more critical or not of the u.s but they were very much in the western camp like the socialist international was, was a hard it, it well it still exists it's a horrible institution of like these reformist parties and Social Western social democracy, most of them by the 50s even expunged um, Marxist concepts from their program. So G German social democracy in like 1959, they removed the last vestiges of Marxism from their program. And they're, I think they're still committed to like some kind of social market economy or something. Yeah. Harrington still kind of clings to that, but in practice, he's not all that different from them. Yeah. Well, he has a direct real world confrontation with a form of radicalism in the new left, the Port, mm -hmm. Huron, the Port Huron statement, which we can talk about where all of this um, comes to a head and people call out in a way they call out the logic of what realignment is actually doing for us. It's, it's it again, goes back to the notion of the eternal return of the same of American uh, politics. Um, and, you know, I mean, today has a, a lot of people on the left. I mean, one of the things is, like I said, you know, DSA, I forget if I said this, or maybe I was just thinking it, but DSA's numbers have grown um, since the pandemic. I think because you're seeing some very, not socialistic policies per se, but, you know, the collapse of Sanders has led to some despair, rightly so. And, you know, the general way of life for many of us, um, so general socialistic policies are um, uh, appearing very sensible, added to which, um, you know, the the Democratic Party is intentionally um, stymieing any mild reform. And, and I would absolutely, absolutely call it an intentional obf obfuscation. So uh, added to which we had a, a significantly militant uprising in Black Lives Matter, right? Um, they were not talking about dictatorship of the proletariat, but I think a lot of Marxists and even on the Zero Books channel where we're talking right now, folks have been talking about this. Can you tell us the kind of something closer to an orthodox Marxist take on this view? Um, not the kind of Harrington view on it or the social democrat view, but sort of what what would you say is the heart of of the importance of it as well? I mean, I, I like how Lennon put it. It's like, it's not enough to recognize the class struggle because Harrington certainly recognizes it. All kinds of people recognize it. It's You have to extend that to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And by that, I mean, if you recognize that this system has is prone to breakdown, crises, exploitation, all the kind of bad stuff that comes with capitalism, it's not enough just to recognize that that exists. That's fine. That, you need to start there certainly but you ultimately want to get rid of it there has to be some kind of material necessity for a different society and you know mark said like uh, this whole theory would be quixotic if there wasn't something in this system that made it that we can have a new society and that's part of also like 
why we need the dictatorship of the proletariat is because the system can't be reformed to make it nice or work better or smoothly. You know, it's in its essentially the whole mechanism. And to get rid of the system, you need basically a proletarian revolution and you need to start socialism. And the proletarian revolution creates the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, in terms of an orthodox Marxist understanding, you know, we start the Paris Commune, which is this radical democracy where ordinary people are running society for themselves, their own interests. And but there is a dictatorial aspect. It's the rule of the majority, the rule of the former exploited majority over the ex the exploited ma minority. Yeah, where there is an uh, an aspect of dictatorship, you want counter revolutionaries not to be in power. You don't want the bourgeoisie in power. Yeah. Uh, another work I. I, I the Lenin work I'm quoting for, which is an orthodox, certainly an orthodox Marxist take, is the state and revolution. Which, yeah. You know, this whole idea of, you know, Soviets, workers' councils, that's part of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And, you know, I, there's a whole long debate about Stalin, but, you know, the point I would just make is what we're fighting for is not to, you know, gulags and, and whatnot. It's to basically so ordinary working people can control their destiny and build a new society. That's, yeah. And it is democratic for the vast majority, unlike yeah. capitalist society, which has all kinds of, you know, tricks and things that are built into its mechanism to make sure that ordinary people cannot actually exercise power. When yeah. we say it's a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, we don't necessarily mean it's a dictatorship as in like there's like some junta. We just mean like the class that rules, that's the dictatorship. Right. So that, of course, exists in like, you know, a capitalist democracy, but it also can exist in like a fascist state like Italy or Germany. Yeah. So the different forms of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he he does not have any commitment to a theory of revolution that would truly trust uh, the development or the refinement of the independence of the working class as the agents of that revolution. To the extent he has an affinity to revolution, it would be some kind of, um, I don't know, 150 years out when the PMC somehow gains uber enlightenment and, you know, we have the most enlightened leaders um, at the helm, ultimately. Now, that view is really hard today for anybody to legitimately champion. Um, and I, <laughs> it, it, it's one of these kind of um, points of cynicism on the left because uh, everyone knows that um, the Obama period of the kind of technocratic rise of these highly competent Ivy Leaguers uh, that could, you know, administer the military, administer all sectors of government and uh, civic life, um, in a way that Harrington kind of uh, wanted in a way, um, that didn't produce any returns, right? So um, there's, a, there's a kind of profound cynicism that's going on there. So what we have here is that Harrington has a theory that uh, enlightened liberal elites will basically be the vanguard that will most, um, that will be uh, the only mediators between a reactionary working class and elements of that working class that can be brought in to progressive liberal uh, values and so on. So that vision of class and power and of social change just has not borne any fruit, especially in our time. And it's just accelerated, like the wrongness of that argument has accelerated. Um, and so what what is your view on on the on how that's playing out today like how this kind of what's called like the residue of the harrington uh worldview which is part of the spontaneous ideology of the american left it's breaking down it's in crisis as an ideology or is it like what's what's your read i mean it's an interesting uh point to bring up so on the one hand, he has this whole vision of, you know, the socialists will work with liberals, change things to socialism. And he was very unsuccessful in his life. Now, we've seen an interesting thing uh, since 2016-ish. Um, so Bernie Sanders ran and DSA picked up members, but it's more actually from Trump's election where they really pick up a lot of members. And it's something like uh, 100,000 now 
close to that number. I, again, I don't know exact numbers. I don't know who's more active in terms of paper membership versus active membership, but it's it's far beyond anything Harrington envisioned. Because I think at his it, when he died, DSA was maybe five or six thousand members, and it was largely that until 2016. It was mostly older people as well. It's much younger now. So what's interesting now is they've also there were people elected through you know Congress and local races in DSA in the 80s and 90s, but it's much more now. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's at least a hundred people in DSA who or DSA claims as members in Congress, local offices, and whatever. So it's about a hundred, and they're all of course Democrats. But I would argue that on the one hand, it's like First of all, the DSA bumps have happened through stuff largely external to them. It's not because suddenly like they recruited a lot of brilliant strategists, but okay, but they picked up on it fine. I also think like what they're largely doing is the same thing in a large sense that he, you know, he advocated when they're campaigning for Sanders, it's the type of strategy Harrington would love. He'd love like the whole stuff around AOC and the other candidates they've done. But on the other hand, they're also running into a bit more of, of the same kind of resistance. You know, the fact that when even they, if their um, elected members even propose even modest reform, they get stymied, blocked. And you're also seeing the same levels of co-option, you know, that are happening like uh, with their elected members. And that's assuming there's, it's also a bit disingenuous also to think like, are these members they're electing part of some kind of unified strategy to change the Democratic Party, to realign it, to have some dirty break? I don't see that. I just see them more acting like the, same, the Harrington Democrats of earlier times. They're just acting like Democrats. They may mm -hmm. say nicer progressive things than other times or not. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's go back to uh, the moment where Harrington has his confrontation with radical elements of the new left and with the SDS, where some significant members actually deconstruct the realignment strategy itself and really um, put him in the corner. And he is forced to respond and defend his position. Um, can you bring us back to that moment? And because I think it's a similar debate to what we're seeing today in different clothes and different forms uh, as, as what he experienced at that time in his confrontation. So yeah, set the stage on that, please. Sure. So the big stage for this is the founding of the Students for a Democratic Society, which is uh, originally from a student group of an old left organization called the League of Industrial Democracy. And Harrington himself was part of the parent organization. And he was only about in his early 30s when this happened. So this is like 1962-ish. And himself, you know, he's actually very revered by a lot of the founders of SDS, who include Tom Hayden. And he, they incorporate a lot of, like, so they're trying to come up with this new vision that fits with the times called the Pure Huron Statement. And the Pure Huron Statement, it's not actually very, like, it's not communist at all. I wouldn't even call it like left-wing social. Let's kind of make this mild social democratic, but it's calling for like, let's fight poverty. Let's support progressives in the labor unions and the civil rights movement and the student movements. And one thing it does do um, is it, it is condemning the U.S. in the Cold War. But it's, it is actually more in line with a true third campus position. They don't support the Soviet Union in the Pure Huron Statement. They're like, you know, this is not a model we look to. We don't want communism. But they condemn um, the uh, Soviet Union. And they also, but they also condemn the United States. And they actually put, probably put the more onus on the U.S. than the Soviet Union, actually. And Harrington himself was involved in some of these early discussions and draftings, but he, when the Pure Huron Statement is adopted, he's incensed by it, even though a lot of his ideas appear in it, because it's not sufficiently anti-communist enough for him. And also, he was incensed as well that a member of the Communist Youth League was at the founding convention. This is just like some 18-year-old kid who was there, but to him, it's like, he actually says something to the effect, it's like, it's basically like having barrier like Goebbels in the room. It was like that offensive to him. 
and he wants SDS to drop the pure Huron statement to, you know, to give in. And he basically, him and like some other members of the parent group, they basically interrogate them. They have a show trial. They lock the doors of their offices. Tom Hayden, who, you know, he's actually, you know, you, you actually, I don't particularly like Tom Hayden that much, but you feel bad for him because he's like, he, he looked up to Harrington as this idol. And he's like, this guy is like, He's basically a Stalinist the way he's treating us. And eventually they're actually able to reach out some of this kind of agreement. And it also went against one of Harrington's things when he saw the early student movement. He's actually like, you know what? These people are going to be a little romantic. They may actually look kindly on things like communism or Cuba. We should be patient with them. He actually says this before this all happens. And he's actually a bit more attuned to this than some of the older members of the socialist party to the student movement, but he just like goes right into full anti-communist mode when it happens. Yeah. And he admits in his memoirs and various writings, like I overreacted. And it's like, if I had actually seen what they finally produced, I would have seen it was closer to my vision. But on another level, he's also said, you know, a break would have happened. And he was kind of right. Cause they were going in a different start. They were taking the first steps in a different direction. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were willing to break with the Cold War consensus, at least on the level of the United States, bears responsibility for what happens. That's a break with like his worldview. Yeah. And that means that they're not going to find a place in the Democratic Party and realignment because they're not going to accept the sacred cows of anti-communism. You can't find a place there. And Vietnam accelerates that. Yeah. And uh, just to talk because this is where the break really happens. I want to make it clear, Harrington, Harrington himself, if you read his writings, he's like, I'm opposed to the Vietnam War. And SDS is opposed to the Vietnam War. So you may ask, well, what's the difference? The difference is not so much that they're at least verbally opposed. It's like how they oppose it. For SDS and for the wider anti-war movement, they're willing to engage in demonstrations, militancy, illegal tactics, burning draft cards, and in some sectors, they're willing to support victory for the Vietnamese communists. For Harrington, that's a no-go. You can't do that. You cannot do things that will embarrass the liberals, particularly the, the liberal Johnson administration who's conducting this great war on poverty. You can't you know, condemn a system because we need to get good people in, this, in office. We need to play by the rules. We cannot certainly support communism. So anything that's illegal, Anything that could put you without, you know, embarrass the liberals and put you outside the bounds of the Democratic Party and, you know, and challenges the dominant ideological consensus is he finds, you know, completely unacceptable. Yeah. So that's uh, where the yeah. comes down on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a, um, I don't know. Tragic comic may be appropriate. I mean, the, the 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 example or the event that makes me even more upset than this one is what he does to Jesse Jackson. Uh, uh, yeah. That broke my heart um, because even if you are a social democrat, many historians I think have said that. Jackson's Rainbow Coalition was likely one of the closest um, versions of a true sort of social democratic mm -hmm. platform. Uh, I think Mike Davis says this in Prisoners of the mm -hmm. American Dream, yeah. and you quote him there. Um, what was Harrington's view? If Okay, Harrington's a democratic socialist, apparently. All right. Yeah. So Jesse Jackson, a black man, comes on the scene – and what does Harrington support him? What does he do? Yeah, so I think that Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition was probably the best and most developed chance for realignment in his life, in Harrington's lifetime. There have been other kind of attempts, but Jackson brings together, you know, all kinds of people, blacks, trade unionists, women, these progressive elements in the Democratic Party. And I would argue within the confines of the Democratic Party, he's actually far more to the left than Bernie Sanders was. He's calling for like the New Deal, Great Society type programs. But in foreign policy, he's not like a militarist. You know, he is supporting things like negotiations with Arafat, ending aid to the yep. Contras. Yep. 
right. and whatnot. And this is a particular, I'm talking the 1984 election. Right. Harrington refuses to support him in the 84 election, you know, DSA. They, they come out for Mondale. And <laughs> pretty early, actually. And, you know, he, he thinks, like, you know, some of Jackson is, like, maybe a bit too extreme. He doesn't like, you know, some of the statements on Palestine and whatnot. And Jackson himself, you know, obviously loses the primaries. And he kind of has, like, this devil's bargain with Mondale and the party establishment. You know, looks, but it's basically like he surrenders. He doesn't get anything in return. He loses, and, the, but he does, he does pretty well, though. He does pretty well. And yeah. he runs again. If, Four years later in 88 yeah yeah and there's like a deliberate on jackson's part toning down on rhetoric and programs trying to reach out to business interests and actually at that point when jackson's kind of toning down harrington kind of reaches out to him and he does support him because i mean the big reason harrington is opposed to jackson especially in 1984 is because the labor bureaucracy and the afl cio comes out very early for walter mondale and Harrington follows their lead. And, but, you know, in 1988, he's a bit more open to supporting Jackson, although he still is excited about the possibilities of Michael Dukakis. He might have been the only one, but even more than Michael Dukakis, I suspect. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, and and then, yes, I mean, in a way, then, you know, Harrington leaves his mark on American politics in ways which I think as we've tried to say in this conversation still somehow um, uh, manifest a, 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 in ways which we can't shrug off. And I want to um, maybe invite you to talk about ways that that we could shrug it off. I mean, for, for viewers and listeners that are not aware some of our comrades have tried to float what's called the Marxist unity vote within DSA to create certain principles, one of which is um, a kind of refusal of cooperation with the Democratic Party. Obviously, that's hard for them to do, and we should, we should be respectful to the DSA and all of the militancy that many of the DSA members do at a local level is admirable. Um, I think the DSA presence in Black Lives Matter is admirable. Um, however, they have this um, Harringtonite um, behemoth of the Democratic Party that they have to contend with, and it makes things uh, very difficult. So, Doug, what what would you say? Um, would do you, do you do you personally uh, would you work with DSA, or do you think that they have um, just gone down a, a wrong path? Like, is there something redeemable? within the largest socialist organization in America right now, in your, in your opinion? I mean, I think there are plenty of members who are, are nice and committed people, friends and comrades of mine. But I, as, a, as a Marxist, as a communist, I, I have a problem with, with uh, joining DSA. You know, when, you, when the organization supports social imperialists like Sanders or Bauman and that should be like a red line. You shouldn't be supporting people like that. What I would say to do, and this is just kind of broad strokes, and you know, I, I kind of going to use the Breck thing. It's like the easy thing so hard to do is like, first, just don't support Democrats. I realize that that, you know, is like a, for a lot of DSA members, that's like what they do. But don't do it. Just don't give them money. Don't support them. The other thing, you know, and I'm, I'm not opposed in principle, of course, to like independent political action by, you know, socialist and working class candidates. But I think for socialists and communists, our main focus needs to be like on, ex you know, extra parliamentary things. So I think, you know, I, I agree that it was good that DSA members participated in, in the Black Lives Matter protest. But I also think DSA members punched way below their weight class in the sense you have an organization of almost 100,000 members and they're probably more focused in 2020 on the elections than Black Lives Matter. There could have been, you know, the weight of that organization been put in there, you know, to like uh, really help coordinate protests. And I think that's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff with labor unions, with Black Lives Matter, 
with all the kinds of stuff you need to fight back against the Biden administration. If you ultimately are talking about, you know, building towards socialism, you want to build towards socialism in the workplaces, in the streets. And I think DSA members, you know, that consider themselves Marxists should be a part of that. But I, I, uh, I mean, and if you're going to build, but you, DSA itself, you know, it should be a red line to not support Democrats for socialists, just in principle. You know, that goes for AOC, that goes for Bauman, that, that goes for Bernie Sanders. And part of that is ideological clarification. It's also, you know, the thing is, you know, we can criticize the more sectarian left for maybe going through their own motions, but, you know, focusing on electing Democrats every two to four years is not going to get you to socialism. It's just yeah. going to get you electing Democrats every two to four years. Right. And the lesser evilism, you know, it does take a, a firm programmatic stance. And, you know, I do think like that does also mean like learning Marxist theory as well. Yeah. You can. And, you know, if uh, whoever's doing that, that's great. But again, it also does mean like building outside of the Democratic Party and ultimately against them as well. Yeah. So on the question of Marxist theory, I think, you know, one upside to the pandemic for some people is, you know, maybe they've um, had some free time. I know many people haven't um, uh, or, or even worse, they've lost jobs and they have all kinds of anxieties that are that are emerging because of that. But um, what kind of other work are you uh, engaged in these days um, within the within the world of Marxist theory? Could you name a couple projects that you are currently engaged in in the world of um of marxist thought marxist theory sure so um i actually just finished a, a book uh called the dialectics of saturn on the question of stalinism and this is from the the adage a revolution is like saturn and it eats, eats its own children and i'm basically looking at debates around stalinism in the soviet union so from this perspective of like anti-communist like the cold warriors what they're saying about it, what people on the Stalinist left are saying about it, um, on like uh, debates around historical necessity. So Mer Maurice Merleau-Ponty, I'm very interested in Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon and like the arguments advanced there. And people who look at Stalinism as like a form of Thimidor. So Trotsky, Victor Serge, et cetera. And, Within that, there's also a bit looking at the Lukashian influence theorist, uh, Domenico Lucerto. And I'm looking at like what he said about Stalinism. And so that's the big project I've been doing. I've also been kind of looking at some of, I'd like to look at, I've started research on something on Stalinism in the third world, which I don't yeah. cover in the dialectic of Saturn, but those are okay. like the big things I've been doing right now. Sounds amazing. Uh, would you mind telling us, um, in brief, um, your take on Los Cerdos Stalin? Uh, because this is a, a controversial book that he wrote. Uh, it's a problematic book that he wrote. Many people um, don't want to emphasize it. Um, and they say, look, if you're going to read Los Cerdos, just... It's, you're better off looking at his book on Nietzsche, looking at his works on liberalism, looking at his works on Hegel, um, not this one. Can you give us a little, a little sure. uh, uh, flavor of our taste of what what you're yeah. up to? Um, so, a lot of Lacerdo's work I like. You know, the Hegel, the liberalism, the Nietzsche, etc. Those are great, good works, great works. Even his work on Stalin is not very good, actually. It's rehashing a lot of, um, it basically it's a rationalization for like a lot of like the Thimidorian policies of Stalin, you know, rolling back on egalitarianism, embracing nationalism, and it's even apologizing for the Moscow trials at times. And I know that there are people on like the Marxist Leninist left who think it's like this great work. It's really not. There are actually better, you know, in the revisionist school of Soviet historiography, there's better works, you know, Deacon Cold War mythologies on Stalin and Stalinism, which I, I mean, I think is actually necessary. But Lacerda's work just, it leans into apologeta 
and it's just not very good. Why, 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 why do you think, what's your interpretation as to why he does that? I, I have a kind of theory, but I'm curious what, because part of it is, is he wants to, in my view, I can just tell you my quick view. Um, and I haven't finished his whole Stalin book in part because I was a little upset with it. So, um, but he wants to recast uh, a different balance sheet of the history of the 20th century, right? And to show that, um, you know, Stalin was unfortunately at the forefront of certain um, advances, um, in especially in third world, developing world, that um, he should not be given credit for, but we should be clear on or something like that. And and I, that seems pretty. Um, uh, it's a tricky point to make. I don't know. Like I have a hard time with that. So so that seems to be. But what how, what's your reading of his agenda there? What's what's going on? I think he see he. I mean, I, honestly, I think he just sees Stalin as or Stalinism as historical necessity. He does not believe in abolishing the state. He's very excited when Stalin embraces this realism. And this also kind of carries over, I think, almost to his view of present day China, because he's kind of got this interesting contrast. He doesn't like like romantic revolutionaries, people, what he calls utopians like Trotsky or Mao, actually, um, who rely on mass initiative. He really likes the state builders, the, you know, people who put in order, you know, people like Diang and Stalin. Right, and right. Just an interesting contrast. And it's like, again, I, I agree with actually attacking like the very extreme, like anti-communist views. But what Lacerdo does is like the flip side of that. Again, right. it reads into a data. When you are like excusing Stalin's attacks on cosmopolitanism, it's really cringeworthy reading. To I, I, I completely agree. Right, <laughs> right, right. It ends up um, defeating the kind of project of your revisionist history like it, it, it backfires right and, so uh, yeah like i agree with attacking theories of totalitarianism but that doesn't mean you excuse like the real crime stalin does again i don't stalin like the math doesn't add up if you say stalin killed 20 million people like robert conquest says yeah but like 700,000 people were killed during the purges and it was completely unnecessary it was completely themidorian yeah and Lacerdo just kind of makes excuses for that. And again, he uh, delves into like this apologetic, like Trotsky was in league with Hitler. And it's like, come on, there's no proof of that. That's rubbish. And as a historian, he should know better. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're going to, if you want like good leftists who like take on like the kind of anti-communism in terms of Stalin, you go to someone like Arno Mayer's work on World War II or the Furies, which really does a much better job if you're looking for something yeah. contemporary. What is as opposed what to is sort of Stalin? What is what is Stalinism on today's left, in your view? Where, where does it? What problems is it creating? Because obviously, uh, it's different. It creates different problems than it did before in the 20th century, right. Cold War, etc. Um, <laughs> so, how would you characterize like contempt the contemporary, like you know, if the liberal left in America has a Harringtonite spontaneous <laughs> ideology. Where does where does Stalinism play into the kind of ideological makeup of today's of today's political climate? It's interesting. I mean, I don't know the exact numbers for a lot of groups, but you do have groups that it's di different, um, like the the PSL, the Workers World, and there's a few other adjacent groups to that who kind of have that, and it's more like. On one hand, they like they're involved in a lot of social movements, but there's a lot of opportunism in what they do, and some of them are give backhanded support for the Democrats. But I think one thing they do that um, is there's a lot of apologetic for them for like anyone who's anti-U.S. in a very knee-jerk way. It's not so much oppose U.S. imperialism, which that's great, but when you're talking about like the the great anti-imperialist state of Iran. Or how wonderful China is, it it gets a bit. Um, that's kind of what they do. It's like they have what I would call if Harringtonism is lesser evilism at home, they're lesser evilism abroad. If that makes sense, like 
yeah. They, like they don't support like working class self organization against like Iranian mullahs or something. Yeah. And yeah, I get it. That, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And I don't well, want to be associated with that. Yeah. Well, you know, Doug, I want to, I want to thank you for your, for your research and for your insights here. Um, oh, you. Can you, can you tell viewers and listeners how to find your Patreon? Because Doug, just I can kind of summarize it quickly. He has a great Patreon, which I'm a member of, uh, where he reads books uh, that you don't have the time to read, or or rather, rather uh, that might disgust you in a way, like this uh, uh, new one by American Marxism by the crazy uh, conservative thinker. I, who's that guy? What's his Mark name? Mark Levine. Mark Levine, right? Uh, you have a review of that book. And so what, what is your approach with this Patreon and what, how do people go to that? To okay. Learn so the, the Patreon is, it's called, I read it. So you don't have to, I, I, the content is irregular just cause I spent a lot of time doing other research, but the, the, the gist of it is I basically read the most far right wing reactionary books I can find and just like l leave reviews. So I did American Marxism, which is like a useless right wing book. Um, I also did the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So, again, I'm talking like the real irredeemable stuff, you know, and that's the idea of it. So, again, it's I read it so you don't have to on Patreon. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a we'll put a link in the yeah. in the video and the podcast. So and then the, the website for Doug is blunkiest.blogspot.com. I think is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's you are generous. You put most of your writing up there. Yes. So, so that, pretty that, much yeah. on the blog is like at least a copy of, aside from like the books, I try to have at least a link to every piece I've done there. Yeah, it's that's very, very comradely of you to do that, Doug. Um, well, I've learned a lot. June first, a failure of vision on the life and the thought of Michael Harrington available with zero books. Doug Green, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. And I encourage all of you all to go pick up Doug's work, check out his websites, and definitely buy this book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All the best.